Tracy Sable tonight on EWTN News Nightly. The results are in from Ohio, Virginia and beyond how the abortion issue played out at the ballots and what it means for the pro-life movement moving forward. Prepare for battle. In the smallest slate yet, five GOP candidates take the stage in Miami tonight for their third presidential debate. We preview what to expect and how they intend to defeat frontrunner Donald Trump. Grasping for hope. We speak with a woman pleading for the life of her son who is being held hostage by Hamas. And treasures of the Vatican. We take you to a meeting in Rome for those tasked with promoting and preserving the magnificent Vatican museums. These stories and more tonight. From EWTN, the Global Catholic Network, this is EWTN News Nightly. In jarring images from overnight, crowds of pro-abortion supporters in Ohio cheer the passage of Issue 1, which now paves the way for abortion through all nine months of pregnancy in the Buckeye State. Ohio's ballot referendum marks the seventh state to expand abortion since the overturning of Roe v. Wade. And while Ohio was the only one to consider a statewide abortion question this year, the pro-life issue was a factor in other key races as well. Fresh off his re-election victory, Democrat Governor Andy Brashear says that he believes the abortion issue helped to drive voters to the polls. I think that galvanizes people from both parties to get out to the polls. People in a, in a Roe v. Wade world may have had certain views, but that's not what we're living in now. In Virginia, Republican Governor Glenn Youngkin says that he was disappointed that Democrats took back control of both the state house and the Senate and acknowledged abortion played a role in the purple state elections. And so I think the one thing that we know is that abortion is a really difficult topic that there is a place to come together around a reasonable limit. Ayankin continued by saying that he is committed to working with the state legislature to find agreement. And EWTN Pro-Life Weekly host Prudence Robertson joins us now. Prudence, what do the results tell us? Well, it was a rough night for pro-lifers, Tracy. In Ohio, a decisive majority of voters at 56.6% voted in favor of Issue 1, and language will be added to their constitution that enumerates a so-called right to abortion. One woman who voted yes on Issue 1 and against unborn children said that it was, quote, the best day of her life when she saw the results come in. And to Virginia, Democrats took control of both houses, both um, legislative chambers, leaving pro-life Governor Glenn Youngkin at all odds with the chamber, a pro-abortion legislature now that is united against him. And moving to gubernatorial races, Andy Bashir defeated pro-life Attorney General Daniel Cameron. Andy Bashir is an abortion extremist, supports abortion up until nine months, and current law in Kentucky bans nearly all abortions. And all these losses, Tracy, they really point to a devastating but undeniable shift in public opinion on abortion since the overturn of Roe versus Wade. But I'll leave you on a high note. In Mississippi, Governor Tate Reeves and Attorney General Lynn Fitch both won re-election. They were both key in overturning Roe versus Wade, so that's definitely a win. We'll have more election analysis tomorrow night on EWTN Pro-Life Weekly at 10 p.m. Eastern. All right, thank you so much, Prudence, for that. Our President Joe Biden supports the Ohio abortion vote, says that he will, quote, continue to protect access to what he calls reproductive health care. This comes one year before he faces re-election and Republican presidential candidates are already lining up against him. White House correspondent Owen Jensen reports. Owen. Tracy, good evening to you. Tonight, five GOP candidates will take the debate stage in Miami, Florida, as part of their run for the Oval Office in 2024. They all want to protect unborn children, while the Biden administration celebrates yesterday's victory for Democrats. President Joe Biden was quick to praise the results of the pro-abortion vote in Ohio. He released a statement saying democracy won and claims voters rejected attempts by mega Republican elected officials to impose extreme abortion bans that put the health and lives of women in jeopardy. Vice President Kamala Harris, who has traveled the country promoting abortion, echoed the president's comments. The voters said, look. The government should not be telling a woman what to do with her body. And from the White House press briefing room, this reaction. 
Americans spoke loud and clear, loud and clear, how we need to protect reproductive rights. Women should have the, uh, we should have the freedom to make a decision on, on their own health care. But Students for Life says the pro-life movement is in a marathon, not a sprint. Making a case for life on the human rights issue of our day, abortion, will not be finished in a single election cycle. And tonight in Miami, five pro-life Republicans will take the stage for the third GOP presidential debate. Tim Scott, Vivek Ramaswamy, Nikki Haley, Ron DeSantis, and Chris Christie all made the cut. And defending the unborn likely to be one of the key topics. I support voters making these choices um, and states making these choices. And whatever the results are, are what the people want them to be. Not seen tonight, former Vice President Mike Pence, who dropped out of the race, and North Dakota Governor Doug Burgum, who is polling too low. Also absent, the front runner, Donald Trump, who is planning his own rally in Florida. Also tonight, one more pro-life response to that Ohio vote. Lila Rose of Live Action writing in part, quote, the truth will ultimately prevail. The truth always trumps temporary political victories. What is the truth? Human life begins at the moment of fertilization. At the White House, Owen Jensen, EWTN News Nightly. All right, and joining us now is Mary Margaret Olihan, senior reporter for The Daily Signal. Mary Margaret, great to have you back on. So what are you hearing from pro-life leaders today in the wake of the election results? Thanks, Tracy, for having me. So obviously these pro-life leaders are devastated at this loss. This is a huge loss here in Ohio. But what I'm hearing is that this wasn't just a messaging issue, as many on the right actually are trying to say. We're hearing from all these right-wing pundits that, oh, abortion is a losing strategy and we shouldn't be messaging on this too much. What I'm hearing from the pro-life groups is that there is so much of a split in the Republican Party on how to handle this issue that they didn't have the financial backing they needed to win in Ohio and to win other places. If you look at how much money these pro-abortion groups poured into Ohio, they outspent the pro-life advocates two to one. Pro-abortion groups poured over $66 million into Ohio into this ballot measure. They also had the support of former President Barack Obama. They had the support of celebrities like John Legend. Meanwhile, the pro-life advocates only really had the support of Senator J.D. Vance and Governor Mike DeWine, and he only came in at the very end. So you hear all these right-wing pundits saying, oh, abortion is a losing message. They've been saying that for my entire lifetime, but at this point, they're trying to act like it's something new and revolutionary. They've just never been on the same page that Republicans can win on culture issues. Mary Margaret, I want to talk about this. I, I want to talk about uh, Democrat Kentucky Governor Andy Bashir's. Uh, he thanked the young woman who appeared in an abortion campaign, campaign ad, that is. How central was abortion to that race in Kentucky? Well, this is just another example of a race where the pro-lifers were badly outspent by pro-abortion advocates. Um, and like I was saying, Tracy, this is an issue across the spectrum. We're badly outspent. Uh, you know, the support for these kinds of issues, these pro-abortion advocates get out there. They have everyone out there. They, they enlist the support of Hollywood, uh, of, of high-profile politicians. And I didn't hear a lot from the front runners in the 2024 election. You know, where, where was former President Donald Trump or Florida Governor Ron DeSantis? Where were all these politicians when it came to talking about abortion and the importance of getting out there and opposing democratic extremism on, in these races? We didn't hear a lot about that. And I, I think you're seeing, you're seeing the fruits of that now. Yeah, you know what, speaking of the, the Republican presidential candidates that you mentioned, I want to pivot that to that now, the GOP debate, which is taking place tonight. Quickly, let's talk about that and, you know, how much of a factor will abortion play into tonight's round? I'm very interested to find out how much of a factor abortion is in this debate tonight because, you know, former President Mike Pence, former Vice President Mike Pence dropped out of the race. I would say up until that point when he dropped out, he was the most pro-life candidate that we had up there, the most willing to talk about uh, abortion and the life issue in general. Uh, multiple candidates have said that they support a 15-week ban on abortion. But when we look at the statistics, that's pretty far along in pregnancy. That's not, that's not the most pro-life messaging that we could be hoping for. For example, we haven't really heard anyone talk about the importance of protecting babies with a heartbeat. That is, you know, something that a lot of Americans support. So I'm interested in seeing how this goes tonight, interested in seeing who will stand up for life. Yeah, we will all be watching for sure. Mary Margaret, always great to have you on. We appreciate it. God bless. Thank you.
Our top U.S. diplomat, Secretary of State Antony Blinken, is speaking out about the Israel-Hamas war. Today, he gave the strongest signal yet about how the Biden administration would like to see Gaza govern once the conflict ends. Uh, it's also clear that Israel cannot occupy Gaza. Um, now, the reality is that there may be uh, a need for some transition period uh, at the end of the conflict, but it is imperative that um, the Palestinian people uh, be central to, uh, to governance uh, in, uh, in Gaza and uh, in the West Bank as well, uh, and that, again, uh, we don't see uh, a reoccupation. Meanwhile, as Israel intensifies ground assault into northern Gaza, thousands of Palestinians are evacuating to the south. The Israeli military gave residents a narrow four-hour window to leave. Many describe the horrors of what they encountered making the trek. We walked a very long way. It felt like the catastrophe of 2023. We walked by people who were ripped to parts, dead bodies. We walked beside tanks. The Israelis called us and they were asking people to take off their clothes and throw their belongings. Children were very tired because there was no water. People were dying and there were elderly who couldn't walk. Thank God we've made it safely. In Jerusalem, families, friends and supporters of the victims of the Hamas attack gathered outside of the Knesset today. The protesters want Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to resign. They are demanding the Israeli government take responsibility for their handling of the October 7th attack. Well, the ongoing war between Israel and Hamas has incited growing anti-Semitism around the U.S. and around the world. Families with relatives held hostage by Hamas are sounding the alarm on Capitol Hill. They are warning lawmakers that similar attacks could happen right here on U.S. soil. Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales joins us now with more. Eric. Well, Tracy, these stories from these families, they're truly heart-wrenching, recalling how that they were attacked and their family members either killed or taken hostage by Hamas. Others tell me that all Americans should be on notice that terrorism is growing and needs to be stopped. The terrorist organization is not just in Israel. It's all over and it's just getting bigger and bigger. And we wasn't enough wake up. Hamas made a great job. But the world, wake up what's happening in Europe, what's happening here. It's not an America problem or an Israel problem. It's a world problem. We need to get everyone to understand that. Family members tell me they're grateful to U.S. officials' continued efforts to bring over 200 remaining hostages home. So I have to say that I always knew um, that the United States of America is our friends. But I never knew their family. Congressman Chris Smith, who chairs the Subcommittee on Global Human Rights, agrees anti-Semitism around the world is growing. He held a hearing on anti-Israel bigotry by the United Nations. Even the special rapporteur at the UN, UN Human Rights um, uh, for Palestinian Territories, as it's called, she says Israel has no right to defend itself. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Just sit there and allow people to be raped, killed? And then there's the issue of aid to Israel. The $14.3 billion bill passed by House lawmakers is at a standstill. Senate Democrats want the Israel-only aid bill to include money for Ukraine and the U.S. border. It's not the time to stop. It's not the time to let evil win. The Ukrainian ambassador to the U.S. tells me the war in her country has worldwide importance and should not be forgotten. It's in both of our country's national interests to provide the support and to stop Putin and stop Russian Federation while it's still in Ukraine, not to allow it to go to the NATO countries, not to allow the ruined, actually, world order. And let's not forget about funding the government. A shutdown is only nine days away. Both the House and the Senate remain far apart on resolving the impasse, not to mention aid to Israel and Ukraine. House Speaker Mike Johnson says that he hopes to have a vote on another continuing resolution by early next week. Tracy. Uh, Eric, I understand there are some new developments uh, in the House Oversight Committee's investigation into the Biden family's business dealings. What's the latest there? 
Well, Congressman James Comer of Kentucky has issued subpoenas to the pre president's son, Hunter, along with his brother, James, and business associate, Rob Walker. The action comes as Republicans continue their year-long investigation into Biden's family business dealings and accusations of influence peddling. The White House and the Biden family's personal lawyer have dismissed the investigation as a political ploy aimed at hurting the president. Tracy? Okay, thank you so much, Eric, for that. We appreciate it. Well, during testimony in the civil fraud case against former President Donald Trump, his daughter Ivanka Trump says that she had no role in her father's personal financial statements. Ivanka is no longer a defendant in her father's New York civil fraud trial following an appeal in June. Her attorney said that she should not have to testify. However, New York Attorney General's office argued that her testimony was relevant. She was an executive vice president at the Trump Organization before becoming an unpaid senior advisor in former President Trump's White House. Well, we have a lot more still to come here on EWTN News Nightly, including a cry for help. I was just waiting to get uh, a message that, that he was identified. We introduce you to Doris Lieber on Capitol Hill, and today she is here in studio calling for the release of her son from Hamas. At a new poll says so-called progressive priests are practically going extinct. Stay tuned to hear more. staying with us. On the one-month anniversary of the Hamas attack on Israel, family members of the hostages taken by Hamas met with lawmakers Tuesday. They called for the release of their loved ones, one woman emotionally recounting what the past 30 days has been like. I was just waiting to get uh, a message that, that he was identified, um, but we didn't get that. Uh, you know, lucky me. That was Doris Lieber, the mother of 26-year-old Guy Illus, who has been missing since the October 7th Nova Music Festival, where Hamas slaughtered more than 260 people. And joining us now is Doris Lieber, the mother of 26-year-old Guy Illus, and Caleb Myers, a leading Christian Israeli attorney and head of the Voice for Freedom Coalition. Thank you both so much for coming on. Doris, I want to start with you. Uh, first off, please know of our prayers. Uh, they're with you and with your family and with Guy. And, and if you don't mind, could you tell us a little bit about your son and also the last time you spoke with him? Okay. I'm very glad to speak about him. Um... Guy is a 26-year-old musician. Uh, he composes music um, and also works in the industry. He's a sound technician and backliner for the best rock bands in Israel. Uh, and he has a very bright future uh, in music. Uh, other than that, he has a lovely dog called Georgie, a uh, husky. Uh, they're inseparable. And a pack of friends, a tribe of friends. Um, last time I spoke with him um, was on the 7th of October. Uh, he, he actually, the night before, came over. It was a holiday. He was on phones, you know, getting ready for the party. Um, and they drove off to the Nova Festival party, about fi five cars that were packed with friends. Uh, the last time that I spoke with him was uh, the next morning, um, after uh, the country was in sirens. The next call I got from his father, he was uh, on a conference call with Guy. Um, he calls me and he is like hyped and he says, um, do you know where Guy is? And I say, yeah, I know where Guy is. He's on, on his way home. He says, no, he's not. He has been in a terror attack. He's now in a terror attack. His friends were killed 
That's what he said to me, and I want to connect you to the line. Mm. Doris, this is so heart-wrenching. I, I can't even imagine. Um, Caleb, I, I want to go to you now, um, the organization that you lead, uh, Voice for Freedom. It's a coalition of Christian groups to be a voice for these hostages. I'm curious, uh, quickly, can you tell us uh, what specific action would you like to see from the Biden administration? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, I think just first of all, we're very appreciative and thankful for the Biden administration and the way that they have made it clear that they have uh, Israel's back uh, during this crisis. And they've also called for the immediate and unconditional release of the hostages. Um, at the same time, they've also, they're also urging Israel uh, toward a ceasefire in the situation. And I think that that's not helpful at this time. Um, you know, the way that ceasefires look in Israel until today has been that uh, Israel ceases and Hamas fires. We were actually in a ceasefire on, on October 7th when, you know, thousands of Hamas militants infiltrated our civilian neighborhoods, raped, murdered, tortured, beheaded, burnt families alive and, and um, you know, ran off with, with over 240 hostages. So the request would be to continue to, to support Israel and everything it's doing, to continue to call for the unconditional release of the hostages and not to pressure Israel into uh, ceasefire at this time. Yeah. Um, thank you both so much for coming on. I wish we had more time to talk to you both, um, but we appreciate your time, and please know that we're all praying for, for every single one of you. Thank you so much, and the hostages. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A new national study finds that priests describing themselves as progressive are practically going extinct in the United States. A study conducted by the Catholic Project surveyed more than 3,000 priests from 191 dioceses. It found striking results from those recently ordained. 52 percent of priests ordained after 2020 see themselves as conservative, with 44 percent as moderate. Meanwhile, no priests in this younger cohort describe themselves as very progressive. Up next on EWTN News Nightly, as if he wasn't busy enough, Pope Francis adds another item on his plate. We hear the exciting news from a world-renowned publishing company. Plus, the beauty of faith, how the Vatican is inspiring benefactors to support the magnificent museums of the world's smallest state. Welcome back. Soon we'll hear more about the Pope from the Pope himself. The book entitled Life, My Story Through History will tell the story of the Holy Father's life through the most important and dramatic events that humanity has experienced over the past 80 years. Some historical events will include the outbreak of World War II and the tragedy of 9-11. The Holy Father hopes younger people read the book to not repeat the mistakes of the past. Well, finally tonight, the patrons of the arts in the Vatican's museums are meeting in Rome this week for a special anniversary. The Interfaith Group is committed to the restoration and preservation of the Vatican Museum's collections and buildings. EWTN Vatican Bureau Chief Andreas Tonhauser has more. To promote, restore and preserve. This summarizes in a nutshell the mission of a Vatican Foundation tasked with inspiring benefactors to support the magnificent museums of the world's smallest state. This week, the patrons of the arts in the Vatican Museum celebrated their 40th anniversary. More than 300 patrons from across the globe followed the invitation of the Governorate of Vatican City State to participate in the week-long festivities. The museum's director, Dr. Barbara Iata, welcomed them in the courtyard of the museums, reminding the patrons that would, without them and their generous support, many works of arts would have never seen the light of day. Because it's easy to forget that most treasures of the museums are not on display, but stored away in the vast vaults beneath the showrooms. Art and restoration experts are working in several laboratories to restore and preserve ancient marble statues, invaluable paintings, mosaics, tapestry, and other artifacts for generations to come. There are 25 to 35,000 visitors every day who let themselves be inspired by the hundreds of thousands of pieces of art on display in the Vatican museums. But ticket sales only cover a part of the costs of one of the largest museums. Additional support is necessary, especially when it comes to restoration projects and outreach. And reaching people not only for the sake of art, but also in order to promote the Catholic faith is another current initiative, led by Sister Emanuela Edwards, who heads the educational department of the Vatican. 
She reminds us that from early on the church used art to transmit and to remind people of the faith. Art can become a bridge also for modern society to encounter the divine. This Sister Emanuela is convinced of. A conviction shared by the patrons of the arts in the Vatican Museums, hopefully also for the next 40 years. In Rome, Andreas Tonhauser, EWTN News Nightly. And we thank you for watching tonight. Remember, you can follow us on social media, Facebook, X, and Instagram at EWTN News Nightly. I'm Tracy Sable. Good night and God bless.